explain to you. This is a topic that is of huge interest to the Learned Society of Wales. Our remit really is kind of, you know, quite aligned with universities and this agenda, and in particular with the research and innovation and the whole of the levelling up agenda. So it's a particular pleasure to welcome our speaker this afternoon, Richard Jones. Um, Croeso Canes Richard, Joachim Ariam Nandod. We're very, very pleased that you were able to accept this invitation. Um, I just want to say a few words of introduction, if I may, and then I'll um, not delay the proceedings any further, and we look forward to, 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 to your lecture. Uh, Richard is originally uh, a physicist, an experimental soft matter physicist. Um, he's, his first degree is in physics, and his PhD is in physics, both from Cambridge. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he's rather good at physics as well, I, although it's not going to be the subject of, his com of this presentation today. He was actually elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in recognition of his work in the field of polymers and biopolymers at surfaces and interfaces. He's produced a significant volume of research work, 190 research papers and three books. He was Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at Sheffield from 2009 to 2016 at Sheffield University, where he spent a, a proportion, a significant time. And during that time, I, I imagine, um, became more and more interested in these areas of work that we're talking about today. He became a member of EBSRC Council and chaired Research England's Technical Advisory Group for the Knowledge Exchange framework, and Richard has written extensively about science and innovation policy. Um, he has become, uh, in recent years, very much, you know, the, the, the man to listen to in this area, and um, it's, it's, it's really been fascinating and interesting to, to see your contributions and read your contributions in, in this, this area, Richard. I'm particularly struck, of course, like many people have, by the uh, the missing four billion headline, which um, we, I guess, I mean, on behalf of most of us in Wales, we rather like that headline. And uh, we um, hope very much that that's a message that's resonating in, in the corridors of power. Um, so on behalf of us all, I would say thank you for all your work. Thank you for taking this agenda forward so well and so strongly. And thank you for being here today. So. With those few words of introduction, I'm just delighted to hand over to you, Richard, and look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Hal. It's a great pleasure to be giving this talk. It'd be even more of a pleasure if I was in Cardiff, but we can't have everything. It's uh, um, uh, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to t talk to you about uh, uh, some of the the, the the work that I've been doing, the thinking I've been doing about the role of science, innovation, productivity, and levelling up. And perhaps uh, 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 thinking a little bit about what this agenda might look like from Wales. So, uh, if I can start my get my screen up. So, uh, uh, I, 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 this talk uh, draws on some, uh, particularly on the report that Hall mentioned about uh, uh, the, the missing four billion. This is a, a piece of work I did for Nesta, grateful to Nesta for commissioning it. They published it in May this year, and uh, it was done with uh, my co-author, Tom Forth, who's a very talented uh, data scientist from, from, from Leeds. And uh, what I want to do today is to talk about uh, some of the lessons that we have, uh, that this, this report might have for Wales. And I, I, I hope that you'll uh, enjoy this and perhaps it'll provoke some thoughts about how we might take those lessons forward. I want to start though by setting this in the context of some very long-standing economic problems that the UK has, that it, particularly its stagnant pro productivity growth and persistent regional economic imbalances. And to do that, I'm just going to throw up a few maps that I think illustrate the graphs and maps that illustrate this point. To start with, Productivity, economic growth uh, over the last decade has been disappointing. It's been more than disappointing. It's been stagnant. And that stagnation has reflected in, uh, in, in stagnating living standards. So I think uh, it's, uh, although productivity may sound like it's a kind of dry economic concept, I think the, the, the consequences of this are felt very widely across the whole country and actually are reflected in, in, in our politics as well. 
So what I've plotted here is the labour productivity. That's the amount of input uh, of output produced on average by uh, by one hour of work, if you like. And uh, what you can see is that this uh, that this this um, trend has been remarkably steady from 1970 right up to the global financial crisis in 2007. Productivity wobbled a little bit around this trend line, but basically it grew at about 2.3 percent per annum per year. With the global financial crisis, that came to an end. Productivity growth stopped, it took, it, it took a dive. And then rather than in previous recessions, you can see in, in, in the 1980 recession, the 1990 recession, productivity rapidly climbed back and re recovered the trend line. What happened in 2007 was something really quite remarkable and quite worrying. It, it not only did the, the productivity transiently fall during the crisis, it has never recovered. It's never gone back to that trend line. And in fact, it's grown very slowly. It's only a, a few fraction of a percent of, of a year. As I said, this may seem like it's a dry economic fact, but it translates directly into, in, into, into wages. So this plot from the uh, from the Resolution Foundation shows uh, mean hourly wages uh, in, in in constant pounds. Again, you can see throughout the, the late nineties, uh, the two thousands, that increased about two uh, uh, two percent a year. It fell. Uh, it, it, it in in uh, it, it stopped growing, and 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 now. Everybody is essentially 22% worse off than they would have been had this not continued. So productivity is a really serious issue. It, the, the stagnation of productivity is really important. Now, I've talked about productivity averaged over the whole of the UK, but the whole of the UK does not behave in the same way. And I think what is perhaps not widely appreciated enough amongst, I should mention, yes, uh, I, I don't even talk about COVID, everything will, uh, that will certainly change things in ways that are probably not great. Um, what I think policymakers based in London don't appreciate is the extent to which the UK is a divided nation economically. Most of the UK is actually below the North European average in economic strength. In fact, most of the UK is actually below the UK average. It's, uh, the, the distribution is, is so skew. So roughly speaking, what we have in the UK is a, a country, London, the South East, uh, parts of East Anglia, are essentially a Northern European country with the same level of uh, productivity as uh, the Benelux, prosperous parts of uh, formerly West Germany, Austria, uh, into, in, into Northern Italy. But outside the Southeast, productivity levels are actually, they're, they're, they're worse than East Germany. So uh, it's, um, they're, they're, it's, we have to look at Portugal and Spain and Southern Italy to, to find a, co a comparison. So I think this this is a really striking and unusual. The UK is really an outlier amongst uh, 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 developed nations in the degree to which it has this economic imbalance. And the, 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 the productivity imbalance is reflected in living standards. So low productivity leads to low living standards. Here are, uh, here's another Resolution Foundation graph. Uh, showing comparing living standards across the UK. Again, you can see the same pattern. Southeast London and the Southeast is a Northern European country. Wales, the Northeast, Northern Ireland, big swathe across Northern England look more like Portugal or Southern Italy. The, in fact, the, 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 the dispersion in living standards is actually less than the dispersion in productivity because the UK does transfer money from the more prosperous parts to, to, to less prosperous parts. But nonetheless, we see this great division. Uh, that, that there's a blow up of the, the, the UK, so, so you can see how that works. And uh, this translates into other outcomes, into health outcomes, for example. So if we look across the, the whole, of, whole of the UK, these, these are, as it happens, female life expectancies uh, uh, from, from a few years ago, uh, you see that uh, going from the, the, the wealthiest parts of the nation to the, the least prosperous, you lose uh, pretty much nine years of life expectancy. Uh, uh, I, I think this is a shocking and scandalous state of affairs. Once again, you see the strong correlation between a more prosperous southeast and a less prosperous west and north. 
Uh, and uh, finally, the final comparison I would like to make is, is to talk about skills. Uh, so uh, we see if we look, for example, proportion of people with no qualifications uh, as an index of skills, you see that same map of uh, uh, much higher attainments in London and the South East by and large uh, Wales, particularly places like the valleys, uh, you, you see this much lower level of skills. I will mention skills at the end again, because I think it's an interesting question about causation. Uh, in my time in Sheffield, you can see Sheffield is, uh, in the, the east part of Sheffield in South Yorkshire is, uh, has very low skills attainment. People would often say, well, you know, to fix the economy, we need to make skills, we, we need to upskill people. I think that I think these are much more coupled than that, and I think I'll come to this at the end. I think we need to um, to, to think about skills and innovation and productivity all much more together coherently than we've done. So we've got this divided nation, and this these divisions show up in uh, in things like how much in, how how much uh, revenue different parts of the country generate for the government. What I've plotted here is the difference between government revenue and current expenditure in different parts of the country, plotted against their, their, their GVA per person, their productivity. So you see, London and the South East are more productive than, uh, the, the, than the UK as a whole, on average. And as a result, they, uh, uh, they put in more money to the government than they take out. Uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, w w Wales is the, the, the least productive on this measure. It's, uh, it's it, with Northern Ireland, it's down in the bottom left hand corner. So uh, th there's actually money being transferred from London and the South East to Wales and Northern Ireland and the North East. I think it's an interesting question about fairness. I think it's tempting to, to frame the, the, the discussion about levelling up, about fairness, about to say, you know, it's not fair that South Yorkshire or that Wales are so much less prosperous than London and the South East. But I suppose, you know, you could turn that argument around and the people in London and the South East will say, well, it's not fair that we have this very prosperous economy and uh, all our money is shipped away to, 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 to less prosperous parts of the country. And that's another point of view too. And I suppose I would combine the two points of view by asking the question, you know, does HM Treasury actually prefer to bail out failure rather than invest in success? Because actually what's going on here is that the UK is an effective transfer union. I think that's good. You know, we, 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 we are an, an, a nation and the, 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 the poor bits of the nation should be supported by the, the, the richer bits of the nation. But wouldn't it be better at the moment what we've got is a kind of revenue transfer that we level up living standards in the weaker regional economies, not fully effectively. You, you know, it's still not a complete levelling up job at all. But what we don't do is we don't invest the capital investments that would make those regional economies more productive. So I, 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 I do see this as being bailing out failure rather than investing success. So I would like to see the levelling up discussion as being about why don't we invest more in regions whose economies aren't doing very well to make them more successful so they can stand on their own two feet in a way, if you want to put it that way. And I think one of the great examples of this, there are other examples, and we could talk about transport, we could talk about other areas of spending, but research and development, I think, is the kind of case study of how this has happened and how the UK's investments, the investments that the UK government makes to drive productivity are concentrated in the places that, in a sense, lead them, need them least because they're already the most productive. So let's have a look at these imbalances in research and development spending across the UK. Here's the data. Uh, th this shows both business and public sector R&D broken down by nuts two regions uh, 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 across the, the, the country. Uh, I'll come, I think that looking at both public sector and private sector, I think is very revealing and I'll come to talk about that more later on. But what you can see is this extraordinary imbalance. If we take those top three nuts regions, well, London, all the regions of London together, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, obviously Oxford and its environs, East Anglia, Cambridge and its environs, they are really well ahead of everywhere else. And down on the left, you see this very long tail of places with very low levels of R&D spending, either public or private. 
So what we can say, actually, public sector is even more concentrated than private sector funding. And I think that's significant and uh, actually rather surprising. But the kind of headline figure that we take from this is that London, together with the two sub-regions that contain Oxford and Cambridge, but that, that, that accounts for 46 percent, nearly all, nearly half of all public and charitable spending on R&D, even though it's only got 21 percent of the UK's population. So if you look at it to, to set this to save your eyesight about where the Welsh regions are, there's East Wales, a little bit below the North East, a bit little below Northumberland and Tyne and Weir. Uh, and then uh, further down, West Wales and the Valleys, just below South Yorkshire, just above Devon. So really, both of those, but both parts of Wales, really in this long tail of very uh, of places with very little investment in R&D happening at all. Uh, how does this correlate to, 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 to productivity? Well, the correlation is a few outliers, but by and large, uh, poorer, less productive regions do less R&D. I'd be cautious about saying, you know, saying there's a direct arrow of causation here going from, you know, that I, I think it's not as simple as saying you just pour R&D money into a place and it becomes more productive. I think you know, it's a more complicated relationship than that. It's probably, you know, both R&D and, and, and productivity are correlated with how many, you know, leading companies, you know, international companies that operate at the technology frontier. It's probably correlated with skills levels, lots of things like that. But uh, I, I think at the level of the correlation, at, at the level of the, the it, it's pretty clear what's going on. So what's the scale of this problem? The government likes to talk about levelling up, and I, you know, I think it's a good phrase. I, I think it's good that uh, people are talking about it, but I do think it's worth emphasising scale. And so, uh, what I've drawn on this little, very simple plot here is how much the public sector spends on R and D per person in kind of these giant super regions, if you like. So if we take London, the South East and the East, so that's, you know, broadly speaking, the part of the country that looks like a prosperous Northern European country, it's about £220 per person is spent per year on R&D. I, I should emphasise this is, the, in, for geographers here, it's the nuts one region. So I'm not talking about the Golden Triangle here, I'm talking about the whole of the Greater South East. So that's £220. Pretty much everywhere else, it's a little, it, it's it's less than, it's about half or maybe a little less than half. So North and Southwest, a little bit more, Midlands and Wales and Northern Ireland, a little bit less. So the question comes, how much money would it take to, to, to level up? I mean, if you just said that everywhere ought to have the same R&D spending per person as the Greater Southeast, what would you get? I'm not really saying that this is how we ought to distribute R&D money, by the way. I mean, I'm, I think this is a useful exercise to get scale. I, I wouldn't actually say that this is how we should do it. But I think thinking about scale is important. So that's to, to fill in those gaps. What would it take? Uh, for the North, it would take about 1.6 billion per year. For the Midlands, about 1.4 billion. For the Southwest, about 570 million. For Wales, about 410 million. Uh, and uh, for Northern Ireland, about 250 million. And those numbers together add up to 4.2 billion. So this is where the missing 4 billion comes from. It, this, this is the money that it would take to, to, to make, to Public uh, the rest of the country uh, being uh, uh, equal to London, and the South East, the Greater South East. What about Scotland? I hear some of you say Scotland's actually quite interesting because Scotland does quite well out of public R and D spending per head. Where Scotland is weak is in private sector funding, and so in, in Scotland, you'd actually the levelling up would need to be done by the private sector, and they would need about one and a half billion of private sector R and D funding to, to to get to UK uh, to, to 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 the Greater South East values. Okay, so the, these numbers, 4 billion, is it a big number? Is it a small number? Important to set it into context. And I just want to set it into context with three other numbers. So the UKRI budget, uh, the year, not, not this year, the year before was 7 billion. So 4 billion, so UKRI is the, the, the government agency that gives out uh, research money on a UK basis. It has a total budget. This year is actually a little bit more than 8 billion. So it's um, uh, it, 4.2 billion is a big number compared to the total UKRI budget. 
But in the March budget, the Chancellor promised that, uh, uh, that the total public spending on R&D would be increased to 22 billion. And uh, that, that would be taking place by 2025. Uh, moot question about how much those, those promises will survive in the post-COVID era. But I'd note that the Prime Minister gave a speech about a month ago and he still said 22 billion was what the UK was going to spend, the UK government was going to spend on, uh, on public sector R&D. So four, four billion, it's a big number, but it's not a stupid number in the context of the increases that are being planned. The other number I've got there is, uh, is about the spending on innovation by the English RDAs. And this comes about, Tom Forth and I have been making arguments like this for some time. And one of the responses that we get from people in London or Oxford and Cambridge is, well, you know, we know about these imbalances. They've been there for a long time. You know, we've tried very hard to fix them, but nothing that we've done has ever worked. And the point is, nothing that governments have done to fix this imbalance has ever worked because nobody's ever tried at the scale that people need. So in England, the biggest intervention was the RDAs that were brought about in the, in the new Labour governments of the 2000s. Uh, and they did spend money on innovation. They spent about 100 million a year for a few years. So you can see that the scale of their spending was about an order of magnitude too small to make a difference. And I think I would uh, in Wales, you could point to the European structural funds as a, you know, a valuable source of uh, regionally specific innovation money. I think that that, that money was spent well and it, I think there were some really encouraging developments from it, but it was just not enough to fi fix the size of this, the scale of the problem that, 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 that we have here. So different places should have different approaches and I here I want to comment on how the uh, private sector and the public sector support each other or don't support each other. I think from the point of view, I think you would imagine that it's the public, that the private sector R&D that produces new products, new services, uh, new, uh, that allows uh, process improvements that drives productivity up. But we know, economists know that the, pub, the private sector doesn't invest, the private sector will systematically underinvest in R&D because it can't get all the benefits of that investment. So if a company makes a new product, some other company will copy that product and it will take away some of the potential profits that the, the first company would have had. So that's the classical economic argument for the state supporting R&D. And on that argument, you might say that it should be some fixed relationship between how much money the, the state spends and how much money the private sector spends. And actually internationally, that sort of is. Roughly speaking, you expect for every pound that the private, the public sector puts into R&D, the private sector will put in another two pounds. So you expect a kind of two to one ratio between the, the, the public sector and the private sector. What this plot shows is that that relationship doesn't happen in the UK. And that's kind of interesting and slightly odd. If we look at the, uh, uh, we can kind of divide this, this plot up into four different regions. So we've got four different kinds of regions at a very coarse level in, in, in the UK. You've got places in the top right where you have very high public sector investment in R&D. That leads to very high business uh, investment in R&D. That leads to a very dynamic innovation-led, knowledge-intensive economies that are very prosperous. Cambridge is a very prosperous local economy. It's a great thing. And, you know, as I talk about levelling up, the last thing I'd ever want anybody to think is, I think, you, you know, we shouldn't do anything to damage the success of Cambridge and Oxford. They're great places. It's a great benefit to the UK that we have places like that here. The issue is that we need other places to be more like that too. We need more places to have that virtuous combination, that virtuous cycle of public investment, driving private investment, driving productivity and growth. Interestingly, we've got two places, London and Scotland, where the the public sector invests loads and loads. London in particular, London is uh, absolutely off the scale in terms of the, 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 the level of public sector investment in, in R&D, but it's not matched by the private sector. So here you might say, well, I, I know there are many purposes for R&D apart from uh, uh, the purely economic ones, but if I was being purely economics minded, I would say, why am I spending all that money in London if the private sector is not, uh, is not following it? 
So here, I think there needs to be a focus on driving uh, driving up business R&D. And I think you do have to worry about the value for money of further public investment. And I think to be fair to Scottish colleagues, I think the Scottish government is very aware of this issue. And I think uh, that, 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 that there are a number of interventions that the Scottish, the Scottish government has a target for business R&D, for increasing business R&D. And I think they're making some very sensible interventions to, to achieve that. Up in the top left, you've got some very interesting places where, where you've got low public sector R&D, even though business is putting the money in. And here, I think that these are places where, if you like, you know, that money's being left on the table. The, the market is saying in the West Midlands, for example, we've got this very strong and innovative automotive sector doing a lot of R&D, very big increases in R&D in the automotive sector over the last decade. And, you know, I think if I was in, in, in some of those companies, you'd be saying, why is the government not supporting us? Likewise, East Midlands and uh, uh, Adair Estates, the Northwest and Chemical and Pharma. So here, I think there are very easy cases to make for more public investment where you can say, um, it, it, you know, the market is, if you like, telling you the signal about where you should do it. That leaves the bottom left where Wales uh, finds itself where you have both public, low public R&D and low business R&D. And here, I think you do need to build up capacity from a low base. I think it's vital that these innovation, that these innovation systems are strengthened. So as I say, it's Wales, the North East, Yorkshire and the Humber looking actually quite similar in many ways. Uh, I, I think there's a very strong case given there the, the, the uh, economic uh, um, underperformance in those regions that uh, these investments ought to be made, but it's more difficult to do it. Northern Ireland, I think, is a rather interesting case. I haven't shown the time dependence here, but Northern Ireland has actually seen a, quite a substantial increase in business R&D from quite a low base. And I think uh, there's a lot to learn from Northern Ireland in terms of developing new uh, innovative activities in Northern Ireland around things like cybersecurity and other digital activities. I think that, that, that it's a great story, a lot to learn. So where does productivity growth come from in the UK economy? I just want to have a slight diversion to talk about how economists think about productivity and uh, what, what, what the, the, the UK economy looks like. Productivity growth it's important to stress, it's not something that happens uniformly across the economy. We've got some sectors where technological change is very rapid. So, you know, in a sense, everybody who's updating their iPhones all the time senses that area of very fast technological change. But then in other sectors, typically sectors that rely much more on direct provision of services, uh, um, productivity growth is much slower. And actually, in some cases, it's not obvious that productivity is the right way to think about it. So, for example, you know, if I was uh, if I'm thinking about social care, for example, having a, a social care worker spending 10 minutes with a client instead of 20 minutes might look like it's productivity, but it's probably not a real productivity because it's, you know, at the cost of actual human contact, actual, uh, uh, you know, actually delivering the service that people want. So uh, I, I think it's important to, to distinguish between those two things. How does an economist think about value? Okay, so I, I, this is a kind of, I, I, I'm imagining it, this is a kind of example from the chemical industry, if you like. If I've got a chemical plant, a chemical plant is something that makes value. How does it make value? Well, at one end, you've got some relatively cheap feed stocks, you shove them in. You've got a plant, so you've got a whole bunch of expensive machinery and equipment that, 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 that you need to do the conversion job. You've got some people working there, so you've got some labour, so you're making labour inputs into it. But there's something else really important that has to go in there, and that, of course, is know-how. You've got to have the science, the technology, just the, 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 the know-how that, that, that your workers have. You might have protectable intellectual property patents and things that allow you to sell the products at a, a, at a premium. Uh, uh, but, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes around for, for, from knowledge. And then what comes out at the other end is products. Hopefully the feedstocks are cheap and the products are valuable. And it's that going from cheap to valuable. That's what the added value is. That's where productivity comes from. And so uh, economists will uh, make a formula out of this, if you like. So in the so-called solid growth model, uh, including technological progress, 
uh, one writes the output as a function of the capital stock, the value of the, 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 the value of the capital stock, the number of hours of labor that's going into it, and this mysterious function A, which somehow defines the level of technology, the level of know-how. And in growth accounting, you can look at the statistics and you can control essentially for, for measured economic growth for the changes in capital stock and labor inputs and what you get there is this thing called total factor productivity which is a mysterious quantity that measures how much better you get at converting inputs both inputs labor inputs the capital stock into valuable outputs and in, economists will think of this as a measure of innovation. It's kind of a bit more than that. Uh, and it contrasts with labor productivity, which is just simply the output per hour of labor. Uh, and so it's increases in total factor productivity that drive, you know, how much value can you get from an hour of work? That's what drives uh, the, the economy. That's what drives living standards as well. And if you, uh, here's a way of thinking about the whole UK economy. We can look at all the different sectors and we can say which bits of it, uh, you know, how, how big a share of the whole economy are these different sectors on the one hand. So if you like, the X axis here tells me how important they are to the economy. And the Y axis, what I put there is the total growth in this total factor productivity over a, quite a long period, a 20 year period. So this is the long run way in which these different sectors have, uh, have got more dynamic. So unsurprisingly, you see the biggest productivity growth has come from information and communication. So, so, so that's the iPhone factor, if you like. We've seen huge technological progress in that sector, and that's reflected in this very big total factor productivity growth. On the other hand, we've got areas like uh, health and social work, where the productivity growth has been less, but they're very important to the economy. Uh, we've got areas like mining and quarrying, which are both not very important anymore and actually have seen a massive negative contribution to total factor productivity. That's essentially, you know, in a word, that's because we used to have North Sea oil and we don't anymore. Uh, 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 and so it goes. Um, I think what I would pull out is there are really three sectors that are the most important, the kind of top right boundary of this. Information and communication, manufacturing, and professional technical uh, and admin services, essentially knowledge intensive business services. I don't really believe the number for real estate for numbers for reasons that I can tell you about. But I think those three sectors are the ones that drive the economy. Uh, of course, uh, we can subdivide it in manufacturing. Manufacturing is important for productivity growth. Uh, we can pull that apart. We can see that the most important and most dynamic has been transport equipment. So that is essentially automotive and aerospace. Pharmaceuticals also up there, also chemicals and, uh, and chemical products. We can look at the time dependence. Manufacturing uh, it was slower uh, in its productivity growth in the mid 90s uh, than the whole economy. But since the global financial crisis, actually, manufacturing has grown faster than the economy as a whole. And as we'll see, I mean, Wales is an overweight economy in terms of manufacturing. And so in a sense, that should be a, a positive for the future. Uh, but since the global financial crisis, we have seen some stagnation in both sectors. Here are some fast growing sectors, finance and insurance activities uh, uh, that, that boomed in the mid 90s. It kind of had a big rise in, in the late 90s due to deregulation. Essentially, it saw a big boom in the, two, in the early 2000s and it fell off, off a cliff in the global financial crisis. And it's been going down ever since. I, I would argue, actually, that, that that's telling us that, uh, that that apparent boom in the 2000s was unsustainable and, and you know, in a sense, not real. Uh, transport equipment, automotive and aerospace, you know, they stagnated in the 90s, actually really took off in the, in the 2000s and actually really massively so after global financial crisis. Uh, actually, I think that's there was some industrial strategy there. I think that that yielded some be benefits, but it shows signs of plateauing now. 
Uh, pharma and chemicals, other important sectors. Pharma showed very strong uh, growth from the late 90s to the 2009, and then it fell off a cliff for reasons that are, are quite interesting, but I haven't got time to go into. Chemicals is striking because uh, it actually just showed steady increases over the whole period. What about the Welsh economy? Uh, the, the Welsh economy is not the same as the UK economy. It's got areas that it's more overweight in. It's got areas that are less uh, that, 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 that are less well represented, and the shape of the economy reflects what strategy ought to be. Uh, here's I, I'm just going to talk about some sector specialisms. So this is just uh, these location quotients that, uh, that are calculated from by, by the Office of National Statistics. Uh, this is rather a coarse grained way of looking at it, but it's just a kind of helpful start. Uh, so uh, these numbers basically tell you if the location quotient is greater than one, that the, the sector is overweight in terms of importance compared to employment compared to the UK average. So we know basic metals is still a big deal. Uh, it's still a big deal for, uh, for, for, for South Wales. Uh, that shows up in the numbers. Chemicals and chemical products. I was actually slightly surprised. I didn't realise that, uh, that the East Wales in particular did have this strength in chemicals and chemical products. I, 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 I suspect um, from a uh, you know being part of the, the northwestern cluster in that area. Uh, electrical equipment uh, uh, slightly overweight. Uh, and computer electronic and optical properties. Uh, I, I, I will mention at some point the very interesting nascent cluster that South East Wales has in compound semiconductors, not really showing up in the statistics yet, but uh, th th there's a slight overweighting in this area for, for, for Wales. Uh, motor, uh, motor vehicles is still important. Uh, and indeed other transport equipment, aerospace, uh, it, you know, there, there's obviously the, the, the Airbus presence in, in North East Wales and other supply chain components. What about things that Wales doesn't have? Well, uh, telecommunications is one uh, example, and of course that's important since telecommunications has been such a driver of productivity growth, not having a strong uh, presence in this sector, it, will you know will have been a drag on growth professional scientific and technical activities is another really important one i think so these are these knowledge intensive business services that i think are so important for the uk economy as a whole you can see they're big drivers of the economy in london and the southeast and here wales is uh, uh, is underrepresented we can break that down computer programming is one aspect of it very big uh, 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 concentration in you know on the M4 corridor, but not far enough along the M4 corridor to get into Wales. Uh, scientific research and development. To get me back to the point I started, R and D is it's not just an input; it's a kind of important sector in its own right. Contract R and D, private sector R and D is really important. Uh, you can see that great swathe from, from from Oxford to Cambridge, where it's an important driver of the economy. And again not uh, underweighted in Wales uh, for reasons that I will come back to. So what should industrial policy focus on? I think uh, um, I've talked about sectors and I know that um, for a long time talking about sectors was not fashionable in UK policy discourse. Uh, there's long been a view and it's still held by some people in government, in, in, in the UK government, that uh, uh, the, the vertical industrial strategy it was all about picking winners. You know, we, we, we should have stopped that in the 70s. It won't be long before people mention British Leyland and Square steering wheels. I think this was a mistake that this went out of fashion so much because as we've seen, the fact is that we have sectors that grow fast, that, that have strong productivity growth and, and, and sectors that don't. And I think one needs to have some focus on supporting those sectors where technological progress can go fast. We have seen some return to sector based industrial strategy since the crisis. I think um, uh, um, uh, the you know, Mandelson came back to, to, to the DTI after the financial crisis and actually got going with a bunch of interventions in the automotive sector, particularly actually that have continued through through all the government since then. So there's been actually more continuity than you'd expect. Uh, 
But what the, 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 I think the question we need to ask, though, is what best fixes the UK's problems of stagnant productivity and regional economic disparities? Uh, it is sectors with high potential for productivity growth, but it's also sectors that contribute to high productivity in those parts of the country that are underperforming. OK, I want to come back to the UK's R&D imbalances. I hope you're convinced that uh, th those imbalances are serious. Uh, in our report, in our Nesta report, Tom Forth and I, we actually thought, you know, concretely, what actually should we do about it? And we really came up with three sets of recommendations. The first one is essentially about devolution. Uh, R&D funding is not a devolved matter. It's uh, primarily uh, held by UK research and innovation uh, uh, in uh, run out of the, the, the business um, energy and industrial strategy department. Uh, so I think there is no two ways about it. We need to devolve substantial R&D funding to the nations, cities and regions of the UK. Uh, we hit on a number, a slightly arbitrary number, but we just for the sake of definiteness, we just said, well, why don't we just say any uplift in public R&D funding, 25% of that should just be devolved straight to nations, regions and cities. The answer, the, the, the objection that I get to this is that when, when I mention this in kind of policy circles, in if I'd say it in, in, in Victoria Street or in Carlton House Terrace, what people come back and say is, well, you know, we could do that, but we just can't trust these people in the provinces to spend the money properly. They'll spend it all on roundabouts or something. Um, you know, they, they, they won't know what to do. And, you know, to be fair, I don't think this is entirely unfair. I think you need to have analytical and institutional capacity to make good decisions about R&D funding. And frankly, I don't think that exists currently in many regions and cities in England. I think it does exist in the devolved nations, though, not to say that it shouldn't be developed further. But I think uh, the, the, I think there is no I, I don't think it's a credible claim to say that the Welsh government and the people that advise the Welsh government in this area are not in a position to make good decisions about it. So, you know, as I say, I think one can always develop it. But I, I, I think the, the, pre, the, 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 the starting point is that the, 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 the devolved nations have mature enough systems to be able to handle devolved money right now. So this should happen. I think we do need new R&D institutions out of London, the East and the South East. One of the really striking bits of statistics that we found in our report was the extent to which capital spending on uh, R&D was even more geographically concentrated in London and the South East than revenue spending. And of course, that just sets you up for even more imbalance in the future. If you build a, a grand research centre in North London, then of course, uh, funding has to follow that, the revenue funding has to follow that to keep it going. So I think we do need more institutions. I think there's a strong argument that that should focus in the first instance on translational research, because I think one has to demonstrate a connection to, to productivity and growth, and that needs to happen. Uh, and the UK um, is, this is a region the UK is not strong in at the moment systematically we've under underinvested in translational research institutes and so i think that would be where i would focus my initial attempt on and uh, we, we think that this idea of innovation districts i think is a powerful uh, tool here so innovation districts manufacturing innovation districts this is something in my time in sheffield uh, sheffield uh, had a, a very successful uh, uh, translational engineering research center called the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center, really developed by a very uh, visionary um, engineer, Keith Ridgway. And uh, 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 over the years, that built up into a kind of really important cluster that attracted inward investment, it drove skills development and so on. Scotland, in Scotland, I think the Scottish government's learned from this. So in Strathclyde, the Nani National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, in, in, in Paisley, in, 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 um, in, in, in uh, near Glasgow. Uh, and it's really based around the same idea, a, a translational research centre, lots of other things around there. What do I think we need there? You need translational research facility, something like a catapult centre, something with national capability, build up major collaborative research programs with industry. Uh, you need to think about how that innovation diffuses into the small and medium, uh, 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 the SME base. 
uh, you need to think about training and skills at all levels. And I think this is really important to bring together the innovation side of the agenda with the training and skills side of the agenda. And if you get this right, you might get inward investment, new, new manufacturing facilities, good quality jobs, private sector R&D labs, high value business services, all the things that come together to make a productive innovation ecosystem. Finally, I have to mention UKRI. I think UKRI does need to change its culture. Um, I think it needs to, UKRI has not done very well at thinking about, uh, uh, about place. I think I got into trouble for complaining when UKRI was set up. Its board, all but one of the board members came from London and the South East. Only Ian Diamond was the only person who was outside London and the South East. I think there needs to be a corporate responsibility. I think there needs to be much more uh, um, formal representation for nations and regions in UKRI. There needs to be more place-based funding instruments. So I think more needs to happen. So has the UK government responded to this agenda so far? I think there have been some good signs. We saw the, 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 the R&D roadmap in July had some good words about levelling up, about how unlocking the potential found in more areas of the UK, uh, build on a wider range of R&D strength, do more to enable places all over the UK to thrive and fulfil their potential in R&D. We've seen an R&D place advisory group being set up and uh, I was honoured to be asked to be on that. So uh, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's interesting. And we see a place strategy expected in December 2020. So it's kind of positive. I, I, I'm, I'm not wholly sure that I'm, I, 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 well, of course, one can always say it ought to go faster. I think it ought to go faster. And I think particularly UKRI. Uh, is, is not showing enough signs of uh, running with this agenda all the way through. What about, uh, uh, what would I say for Wales? What should we do to build up R&D and innovation capacity in Wales? Well, I go back to, to my quadrant diagram just to remind us where Wales is. It is in this position in the lower left-hand corner. It has got both low public R&D and low business R&D. And so one does need to build up capacity from a low base. How would you do that? Well, I think uh, that, that we've got existing high productivity growth potential sectors. So I think, you know, aerospace is important. I think the, uh, the, the, the uh, Aerospace Research Centre in North East Wales associated with Airbus that Sheffield had something to do with is, is a very positive development. I think it's worth taking bets on new and emerging sectors. I mentioned compound semiconductors before. I think the Welsh Government has done a good job over about 10 years in building up that sector building up strength in the university base, bring, you know, building research groups in those areas, bringing in translational research facilities with the compound semiconductor catapult, supporting skills and innovation. I think it's been, that's a good story and it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's positive. But I think we need to support big strategic imperatives. There are things that we need, just need to do more of that just, we just don't do anywhere in, in, in the country enough. We've got a net zero greenhouse gas target. Uh, I think I talked about health inequalities. I think this is a really scandalous situation in the UK. I think we need to end those health inequalities. We need research directed towards creating a health and social care system that is both high quality and affordable and is much more uh, uh, spread across the country. I will say something about net zero just to stress what a huge target this is. We've actually done not too badly in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions so far, but in a sense, we've done all the easy bit. We've exported our heavy industry, we've made a dash to gas, and we've got about 50% low carbon electricity through biomass, offshore wind and old nuclear. But to get from where we are now to 2050 is a massive job, and I don't think enough people understand how massive it is. It's going to take, uh, it's not just decarbonising electricity so that's that's important we've got to decarbonize domestic heating we've got to decarbonize transport we've got to uh, uh, decarbonize heavy industry and we've got to hugely expand zero carbon electricity so there's a whole range of technologies that need innovation to be cheap enough to happen offshore wind maybe floating offshore wind new nuclear i think is really important lots of different things so there are huge imperatives that the nation has to to, 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 to do. Those are places that clearly I think uh, one should select for, for R&D. 
Uh, different kinds of places need different policies. I think, uh, you know, geography is granular at all levels. <laughs> Not everywhere is the same. And I think within Wales, there are different kinds of places. We have cities that don't perform well enough. Now, I think this is something that's not understood well enough and maybe a slightly unpopular view. Uh, one of the striking features about the economic geography of the UK is that it has one really strong city, London, and then its second tier cities underperform. So if you go to European countries, if you look at Lyon, you look at Dusseldorf, second tier cities in most European countries are highly productive. Somehow the, the, the gains that economists talk about when they talk about cities, so-called agglomeration gains, we don't seem to capture them in the UK. So our second tier cities are not doing well enough. So I think uh, you know, Cardiff is the, the richest part of Wales, but it could be richer. And so I think Greater Cardiff should do more to drive the whole economy of South Wales. Now we have de-industrialised areas that have really big problems. So the valleys, uh, uh, you know, as in many parts of South Yorkshire or Bury uh, uh, and uh, North East Manchester, these places have a lot in common. What they have is they got, they've got into a bad equilibrium where we've got low productivity, low innovation, low skills. And I talked about skills at the beginning, and I think it's really important to think about skills from the demand side as well as the supply side. It's not enough just to say, oh, we've got to train people better. You've got to have good jobs that demand skills before people will do that training. So you need to bring together innovation policy and skills policy to break out of that bad equilibrium. And then we've got rural and coastal areas. Here, connectivity is vital. Uh, getting, getting around is crucial. But everywhere has got local endowments. They've got cultural and landscape assets, but they've also got, you know, uh, uh, you know outstanding natural harbours. Milford Haven is a, you know, where would you want to build a floating offshore wind industry? Uh, Milford Haven, maybe. Got licensed nuclear sites in Wilver and Anglesey. So there are things to be done there. How would you do it? I think you need a joined up policy. I hope that I'm sure this happens already, but it's a question of the Welsh Government working with partners in business, academia, educators, civil society to create a place sensitive policy. It's got to be joined up though. And I think this is what a devolved nation can do that doesn't happen in, in, in Whitehall. I think it's really vital to bring together R&D, innovation, skills, business support, healthcare, all in one place. I mean, it's legendary in, you know, the fact that uh, Bayes and the Department for Education hate each other so much. They, you know, the idea that you join up innovation policy and skills policy in England, it, it, it can't happen just because of the dysfunctionality of the Whitehall government. So Wales has an opportunity to demonstrate that a devolved nation can get over those, 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 those silos and make a really, truly joined up policy. I think the UK government and its agencies need to get serious about making these investments uh, in R&D and in other areas that you need to level up. And I, I, I wish I was more confident. You know, we've got good noises coming out. I would like to see uh, delivery on those good noises. And of course, then you need more collaborative working between the, 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 the UKRI and the Welsh Government and other actors in Wales. So there's more, more, more of that local knowledge that's so vital in making good policy. So uh, I've come to the end. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I've written a few things about this. And so if anybody's interested in reading any more, that's the link to my Nesta project, uh, my, my Nesta uh, paper. My paper from uh, a paper that gained me a certain amount of notoriety by celebrity endorsement by Dominic Cummings, so, which you can get off my blog, and an earlier paper I, I wrote about biomedical uh, imbalances and biomedical research. So with that, I'll say thank you very much and hopefully ask for any questions. Richard, thank you very much indeed for that wonderful talk, which um, has raised a huge number of issues for me and I'm sure for many of us. Perhaps I could just introduce myself briefly. I'm Helen Fulton, the Vice President for Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences of the Learning Society of Wales, and I'll be chairing the Q&A session. 
Perhaps I could start by reminding everybody to ask your questions in the Q&A panel rather than in the chat box. And if you want the question to be answered in, in sort of a priority order, um, people need to, uh, need to um, tick the thumbs up box to get more votes. So the higher the number of votes the question has, the sooner it will be answered. So that's how the system works. Perhaps I could start then with a couple of questions that have already got um, a couple of votes. Starting with one from um, Nia Roberts, who says, I think your location quotient analysis was per NUTS2 region. Might there be specialisms that show up on a more localized analysis? Yeah, of course there are there. I mean, NUTS2 is a terribly coarse uh, uh, division, it's particularly coarse for Wales, bringing in kind of, you know, Flincher and, uh, and Gwent as, uh, into one bit, which, you know, makes no sense at all as kind of a, a sensible unit of economic geography. So absolutely, yes. And, you know, that's a kind of, that illustrates the point that I would make, you know, you need local knowledge to make good policy. And I think that's the, that, that's the kind of crucial argument for devolution, isn't it? You need to be able to have the local knowledge to understand where a nascent cluster what might be emerging in, in 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 one part of the country or the other that, that might need support so yeah absolutely i mean you, you know it's an interesting question about ons i mean ons has got much better at doing regional statistics you know one of the things i did a piece of work a few years ago about industrial strategy with uh, kate barker and diane coyle and craig berry and you know one of the great conclusions from that was you know you can tell that the uk government isn't interested in regional economic development because it doesn't collect the statistics you know it's this kind of old seeing like a state argument the state collects statistics about things that it's interested in it's not interested in regional development it doesn't collect the statistics i think it's good you know actually ons has got much better we see much better local gva statistics we see much better kind of local sectors based statistics but it's still not good enough it, you know i think you know i, I did a I was involved in a science and innovation audit for South Yorkshire uh, a few years ago. And, you know, it's clear from that, that, that the numbers aren't good enough. So, it, it, yeah, your, your, your point is both correct and important in that, uh, you know, you really need that, that, that local knowledge. Thank you. The next question was initiated by Andrew Henley, who picked up on the idea that sector led approaches may not have worked well in the past. So he asks, do you think that the past sector led approaches have not perhaps worked as well as they might? And he points out that regional incentives have not been particularly successful at encouraging um, the relocation of some private sector organisations into particular regions. And he says that um, lagging regions, and this is worldwide, not just in Wales, all have the same list of sectors that they want to attract. So every region wants to attract the same kind of businesses and it becomes a zero sum game. So, you know, does that impact on the idea of, of having a sector led approach to encouraging productivity? Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, 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 those are important questions. You know, I think it's really important to look back at, uh, at uh, uh, interventions in the past that have been made that haven't been as successful as you'd like. As I say, I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, if you want to be positive about it, I do think the sector led approach on automotive has actually been quite successful over the last couple of decades. I think, you, you know, in the mid 2000s, the UK automotive sector was absolutely at, the, at rock bottom. And, you know, you can't say that anymore. It has its challenges, certainly, but it, it, it's been uh, hugely supported. I think it's a question of, you know, what the type of intervention are. I think the, the, the relocation point is important as well. Absolutely. It, it, you know, it's a terrible thing to get into this kind of zero sum. Let's see how much we can bribe Amazon to go and put a warehouse in our in our area. I think that's why, uh, uh, you know, you need to have that knowledge of what you've got already what i think it's thinking about the the the, the sector and around as it were i'd say what can i do in terms of innovation skills that will be you know not just a positive attractor to one particular factory but will just will, will say well actually you know 
that whole supply chains would like to come here and take advantage of what's going on here. So I think, you know, it takes realism. I think, uh, you know, the other kind of great science policy or innovation policy disaster that everybody talks about is the micro and nanotechnology uh, uh, center debacle of the mid thousands where uh, we ended up with 36 uh, or some number of micro and nanotechnology centers none of which had any critical mass, many of which were not connected to any kind of local industry base and thus all failed. So I think those are kind of, you know, we have plenty of cautionary tales about how, how to do it wrong, but I think that's no reason not to try and learn those lessons and try and do it better. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a number of macro and micro questions. Um, there's a big macro question coming up from Simon Hazlitt who asks to what extent is international cooperation important for levelling up? And I can see that Sarah wants to actually answer this question live, is that right? Oh, okay, so Sarah is going to take that one. So we'll move on to a micro question now, which is from Claire Gorara, um, asking you to comment on the value of cultural industries, as this is such a, a strength in parts of Wales and related um, small and medium enterprises. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it it is important, and I kind of uh, it, it would be surprising if someone hadn't asked me that since I was kind of banging on about aerospace and R and D so much. I mean, I think uh, uh, yes, at, 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 again at a micro and macro level. I mean, I think you know it's very that there's a very convincing kind of creative industries cluster based around Cardiff, and that's uh, ha had a huge importance for for, for developing. The economy of the city uh, so, so, so you, you know at a kind of at quite a large scale that, that that's clearly important and then as I kind of mentioned in terms of you, you know what happens in um, in uh, you know coastal and rural areas you, you know the, 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 uh, it sounds very kind of um, economistic to talk about it as a cultural asset but you, you know there are very distinctive cultural assets that the that, that rural and coastal Wales has that can can, can be built on to to, to, to to drive value I suppose what I'm going to say to that is I you know I agree with those points and but you know I bang on about R&D because I'm interested in R&D but I don't think that R&D is the most important thing in you know, is the only important thing in the world. I think it's a quite important thing, but there are other factors that that, that drive economies and indeed drive communities, and that, that those are important too. Okay, well, perhaps I could go back to Simon's question about international collaboration and how important do you think that is in driving up productivity? Yeah, well, okay. I, mean, I think this is this is a, a, an interesting. I mean, this is a very important question and one that, of course, is very timely. What with our international trade relations about to be turned upside down, I think uh, uh, again to go back to the automotive sector. The automotive sector has uh, flourished because it became part of a very globalized supply chain, and uh, it's uh, you know on January the second it remains to be seen how much damage will be done to that. I mean, you know, we still, in, you know, there are negotiations about, uh, about um, uh, you know, um, local origin rules that actually, you know, have quite serious consequences for, for, for those sorts of industries that are able to gather together, you know, huge range of complex parts, put them together in something even more complex and then sell it, you, you know, add lots of value that way. So, I, I mean, I think that, you, you know, on the industry and innovation side, that's a, a problematic issue. On the kind of R&D side, yes, I think, you know, UK science in general, Welsh science, Welsh uh, uh, research of all kinds, the social science and humanities too, they gain huge strength from being international, for being collaborative, for having uh, overseas researchers freely coming to and fro. It's um, that that's uh, you know the spread of ideas internationally is a very very powerful driver of productivity and uh, one has to hope that we can hang on to as much of that as we can. Yes it's certainly something that's being um, uh, very much encouraged at universities. Um, I want to move on to a question from Nick Clifton now who says if we start with the premise that increased R&D spending is a good thing and it should be devolved 
how best can we actually join up the supply and demand for R&D? Would it be through things like agencies or brokers, innovation prizes? What kinds of things are you thinking of? Well, I think uh, I, it depends where you are on the kind of innovation spectrum, doesn't it? So, so it, uh, 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 and I think, you know, again, I've kind of um, focused on translational research because I think it's important. I think one should focus on, I think it's important that the whole landscape is, is supported and different parts of the landscape will be supported in different ways. So, for example, you know, the, the university base is very important. Uh, you know, unrestricted block funding, QR funding, actually both for, 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 for research and for, for, for knowledge exchange is important. So, so I think, um, you know, um, the Welsh Government will be very well advised to, to, to make sure that the, the QR part of the equation is preserved to, to, to allow universities to have the flexibility to support uh, new and re uh, emerging research areas, research areas that, uh, that, that are not particularly thematic, if you like. I think, uh, I, I think uh, collaborative research is important and I think, you know, what you need there is, you know, I tried to say, say at the end, it's about, you know, co-creation. How do you set research priorities? It's some combination, I, I, you know, businesses are important, but it's not just businesses. I think that uh, um, communities are important too. As I say, in healthcare, is, I, 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 and I wrote a lot about healthcare, I haven't really talked about it very much, but I think, you know, much more community involvement and setting directions for, for healthcare research would be, uh, I, I think, enormously beneficial both for the research and for its impact, if you see what I mean. So I think, uh, you, you need to design design agencies carefully at the different stages of the research journey, if you like, in, in ways that are appropriate for different parts. And so what's appropriate for a kind of near market support for the aerospace industry will look different from uh, a, 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 a you know, supporting uh, humanities in a university. Yeah, it was quite interesting where you said there's a sense of a lack of trust in terms of devolving R&D funding to regions. And it's, it seems a shame that that should be the case. And, and I, would, I would agree that universities surely have a really important part to play in receiving the devolved funding and making very good use of it. Indeed. Indeed. Um, a question now from Stefan James, who asks, is there proof that research institutions develop the local economy and that the knowledge and wealth isn't simply exported to other regions. So how do we ensure that the CSA catapult engages and develops Newport companies and not companies from Southeast England? Uh, yeah, okay, really interesting question. And I, uh, I, I, I can see both sides of it. Actually, I think it's, I, I think the compound semiconductor catapult should support companies in the Southeast of England, actually. I think uh, you shouldn't, uh, 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 you know, it, this goes back and we talked about international networks. National networks are important too. It's important that uh, the expertise is drawn over from all over the, the, the country. What's the proof is a really interesting question. And uh, uh, the way I think economists uh, um, need to think about this more, he says arrogantly, telling all the discipline what to do. Um, it's, um, you know, people do, economists have tend to think about, have tend to think about uh, innovation and R&D at the national level. But there is, you know, there is now starting to be econometric evidence that shows that the benefits of R&D are more localised. And that really comes about when you have a slightly more sophisticated understanding of what the relationship between R&D and productivity actually is, a kind of less linear relationship. And you realise, you know, it, it's not really often, it's not really the, the particular invention that somebody happened to make in the University of Cardiff that, you, you know, I mean, some inventions are made in universities and they make spin out companies and that's all great. But much more of it is probably about people. It's about skills, skilled people leaving the university university going to a, a company it's about people going from one company to another company I think that's why you know inward investment done right is actually potentially rather good because if you've got um, uh, you know a, a company that has very high standards 
uh, and you've got companies around that are maybe not as dynamic. They haven't kept up with modern trends as much. Just having people move about from, you know, getting a job from one, moving from one company to another company to get a job, it makes a difference. And of course, as soon as you, when you've got people involved, then that's when geography matters because people don't like to just up sticks and move 50 miles. You know, people can have, you, you can have, you know, couples with, uh, People want to stay close to their family. People, you know, people, whether whether you can change whether you can change your job without your children moving school, I think is is the sort of factor that defines what is. You know, when we talk about cluster, what do we mean by that? That's what we mean. So it is about you know traveling around. How 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 far you can travel if you can change your job. It's about. Uh, and it's about you know the reasons why people want to stay in one place. So you know I'm sure you've got people who graduate from Bangor, for example, who who kind of like it there and they don't want to immediately go and live in Lower Stoft. So you know geography it matters. It's, it's the human factors that make geography matter. I think. Yes, I think that's true. And we've all had to rethink that a bit with lockdown and working from home and so on. And, uh, you know, this kind of interface. So that's made a difference, I think. And, and sort of balancing regionalism, which can be a good thing in terms of bringing resources to places that need them. You, you don't want to confuse that with parochialism, where, you know, you become inward looking and you're not open to other opportunities. Um, moving on to Paul Meredith's question, who says, Richard, do you think the UK government's 2.4% R&I target is having an impact on industrial R&I spend? And do you think it's driving inaccurate estimates of spend from the sector? Um, yeah, interesting. It's always in, I mean, so the 2.4% target is a fascinating target because it, the government has set it, but it's not in the government's power to deliver it because if we take this two to one ratio, we'll only reach 2.4% uh, spending as a proportion of our uh, of GDP if the private sector uh, increases its own spending by a substantial amount. So currently, I mean, the R&D intensity is currently 1.7%. So uh, w w one needs to kind of increase it by about 50 percent, and that needs to be the private sector increasing it, too. So um, uh, the, 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 why is the private sector going to do this? The private sector is only going to do it if we demonstrate that the UK is a kind of, you know, a worthwhile place to invest. I mean, the UK also has this very important fact, which is that more than half of its business R&D is actually uh, put in by overseas companies. So it's all about how do we persuade, uh, you know, boards in the Netherlands or the United States or Korea that uh, they would like to not just maybe build a, 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 an assembly plant in, in, in the UK, but to have an R&D function here. So. Uh, that, that that that's that that's a really important challenge for industrial strategy. So the two point four percent target, in that sense, it focuses people's minds on the need to attract private sector investment. Of course, whether it distorts it or, or not, I, I, I'm not sure. It's it, it's a bit early to say how that's all going to play out. Okay, thank you. A slightly related question from Judith Phillips who asks, how do we square UKRI's emphasis on scientific excellence and place? OK, so I've got an easy answer to this, which I've given to many people, which is that place, no place is excellent. Cambridge is not an excellent place. Cambridge is excellent. It's got excellent people in. So uh, it's all about people. Um, you can get excellent research by persuading excellent people either to stay there if that's where they're from or to move there if that's not where they're from. So um, uh, I, I, I think excellence, uh, you know, if you create the circumstances where people would want to go to do excellent research or people would want to stay to do excellent research, then you can, uh, then you can have excellent research anywhere you like in the UK. So, so if you focus on the people and what makes people want to go to certain places to do their research, that's half the question. I think there's another issue about what you mean by excellence. Excellence is a kind of, um, uh, you, you know, I think it is true to say UKRI 
funds excellence for some values of excellence, um, but but the values for excellence are different. And you know, I had John Kingman ask me this question, and when we had some meeting about it, and I said. You know, at the moment, over the last couple of years, I've sat on two big panels. I've sat on an ERC, the ERC Condensed Matter Physics panel, and I sat on the Strength in Places Fund panel. <clears throat> and, you know, they were both good panels, and they were both very focused on excellence, but what they meant by excellence is quite different, and that's as it should be. I think what needs to be, you know, quite clear about define you know ERC absolutely knows what it means by excellence it's all about it's all about the science it's all about um, uh, you know the adventure of the science the, the the possibility of producing you know really fascinating and surprising results with no particular strategy to underpin it if you are talking about the science that would be needed to underpin some new um, industrial cluster that's excellence too but it's a different type and you need, just need to be clear in understanding what you mean by excellence whenever you say it rather than just by saying it as some kind of boo word that you know means it all has to go to Watson Cambridge. Great though those places are. <laughs> and Judith has a follow-up question which is what about the well-being economy given Wales's volume of public sector reliance? Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I think this is really important, and I haven't talked about it, but I, it, it, my last slide mentioned the biomedical bubble, which I uh, wrote a couple of years ago with James Wilston, which was all about have we got the balance right in the R and D that we do to support, uh, you know, health and well-being of the population more widely. Um, this made me very unpopular in various circles. I had to kind of put a paper bag over my head every time I went past the Crick Institute. But um, I think, you know, it raised important questions. And I think, you know, what I would say is, you know, the UK government has a life sciences sector. It has a life sciences sector strategy. I think that's a category error. There is no life sciences sector. There is a pharmaceutical sector, which is important. It delivers you know lots of value it makes some some medicines that are that, that, that are very important there's a whole health and social care sector which delivers which are you know the people who 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 um who who deliver health and social care which is again very important but it's quite different from the pharmaceutical sector and then there's a whole area about public health which we have neglected terribly as i think we found out in the last few months and which is, you know, very much related to well-being and, you know, broader measures of, uh, of well-being that are connected to economic inequalities and other kinds of inequalities too. So I think more clarity is needed about the different, uh, you know, those different areas. Mm, that's a really good way of breaking down that whole kind of umbrella of life sciences, which, yeah, I agree is quite problematic. <laughs> And a, a sort of um, nuts and bolts question from Greg Mothersdale saying, how is R&D spend measured? Yeah, interesting question. It's measured. Uh, um, so there's a um, there's a, a, a definition, the Frascati definition, which um, everyone, all, all these nerds uh, have to follow. So that if whoever is in government reporting their R&D spend will will check it against the Frascati definition to see whether it it, it, it's defined well enough and that uh, so, so you know that that's how public sector R&D spending is measured that way by uh, whoever is in the civil service allocating the, the funding in the private sector it's measured in two ways it's measured by a survey so the ONS does a survey and it kind of writes out and says how much spending on R&D are you doing and it's also measured by R&D tax credits so, so uh, um, there's quite a generous support for companies so companies can claim back quite a large amount of money against their R&D spending and this is really substantial actually it's about four billion if I remember right uh, 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 over the whole country uh, so in that case they um, you know they, they they write off to, to to the inland revenue with a kind of broken down list of what they do and why they think it counts as R&D and if it's judged to be correct according to the definition they get a check back from the Inland Revenue so <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you 
Um, we're coming to the last few questions now. Um, there's one from Mark Lee, who says that Wales has some potential innovation in tidal power but cannot proceed because the UK government won't support it. How can we get over such vetoing? Uh, yeah, uh, um, I think the UK government needs to get an energy policy, essentially. I think, you know, and hopefully we will, we will see one emerge. You know, I think 2050 net zero target is a fantastic target. I'm really I'm quite surprised and really pleased and impressed. I think it's the great credit of the government that they've adopted it. I think they haven't fully worked through what that entails, what actually you need to do to get that to happen. And I think someone needs to actually um, come up with some plausible trajectories for getting there. And you know, the tidal power is you know, one of the um, clear possibilities. Uh, the Bristol Channel's got a very big tide in it. I know that all too well. So, you know, it's a very big potential resource. So uh, it's a question of, uh, I, I, I suppose what I'm saying is don't feel singled out that the government hasn't supported tidal energy enough. It hasn't supported lots of other things either. And it comes from not really being serious yet about what net zero means. Yeah, it comes, it, it's related to what you were saying about a joined up policy and also about devolution of R&D funds, yeah. Um, uh, John Barker asks, given the importance of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, how are you ensuring your supply chain and innovation activity is benefiting local SMEs and ensuring productivity in Wales? Uh, yeah, I think this is, you know, this is about good policy design, isn't it? So, I, I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I think, you know, we do need, I mean, in a sense, this is related to the last question. I mean, I think, you know, we need more foresight than, than, than governments have been particularly good at doing. And so it does need some, I mean, you know, uh, you know predictions are difficult, especially about the future or whatever. Uh, it's, it, you, know, you know, it's hard to do foresighting and, you know, there's all kinds of errors that people have made, but, you know, that doesn't stop us from wanting to try. You know, I think you do need to have a vision for what you think you would like the economy to look like in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. And uh, you, you need to measure your interventions against that, 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 that vision. And a question from Martin Pollard, who says that you mentioned the usual approach is to bail out parts of the UK, the ones that have the lower R&D, rather than to invest in them. And how, how can we explain the prevalence of that approach? Uh, we do our best. I mean, you know, there's kind of technical discussions. You know, my colleagues on the, the, the work I did in industrial strategy, I, I had colleagues, Diane Coyle and Marianne Sensier, did a lot of very good work about the Treasury Green Book and why the Treasury Green Book kind of um, it really um, is sort of structurally constructed to to to, to argue, you, you know, to, to disqualify those kinds of investments. And, you know, the, the Green Book, it, the, 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 there is some progress. There is a report that the, uh, I mean, the, the Treasury is revising the Green Book. So, you know, you just cheat, cheat, keep chipping at it, really. And the last question is a follow up from Nick Clifton, who, who's coming back to the idea of R&D credits. And he says that Wales has a, a lower than proportionate take up. Um, this could be a relatively easy win. How can we increase this? Uh, does, I, I mean, I don't know that, actually. So, so I, I, mean, I don't know whether the, what the problem is. I don't know whether the problem is that R&D is being carried out and Welsh companies not claiming against it or whether that it's a question that Welsh companies maybe are doing R&D that, 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 that could be classified as R&D, but that, that they're, not, um, they're, that, 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 that they're not claiming. So I, I don't know. I and mean, I think, you know, a, a good innovation agency that was, you know, supporting companies in increasing their R&D intensity would be supporting them in, in, in claiming their R&D tax credits too. So, but I, 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 I don't, I, I can't say I know what the problem is enough to be able to identify the solution right away. 
Okay, thank you. Well, uh, those are the end of the questions. Um, you must be exhausted after all that. Thank you so much for your very generous answers to all the questions. I'm going to hand back over to Howell to wrap things up. Thanks, Howell. Thanks very much, Helen. Well, we started at four and it's uh, half past five now, Richard. So I think the first thing I need to say is I think we've had our money's worth from you this, today. I hope, as Helen says, that you don't feel overworked. Um, we've had a really, really impressive presentation. Uh, I have seen some of your presentations before. And I think, you know, I obviously learn, learn a lot from every time I see them. And the thing that's, that kind of stood out for me this time, and kind of slightly embarrassed to say I hadn't really noticed this before, was just how far London and the Southeast was ahead of the whole of the rest of the UK. So if you compare South Wales or Wales, I would normally have sort of been comparing it with, say, say, you know, the Northeast or something like that, you know, some of the areas that we would traditionally, so maybe old coal mining areas, that sort of language, you know. But I was quite struck that, that um, we, we sort of didn't compare to, kind of the, the, the Northwest, your home, your home base, if you like, the Manchester area was, wasn't performing that much better either, you know, and um, I guess, I mean, I don't know whether I can take some comfort in that or whether, or whether, or whether but at least it, it, it's, I think it's an important point to know that, that so many of the regions are, you know, just in a similar state, really. Um, I did detect a slight sort of sense of the physicist in you as, as we were listening to the presentation. So I thought getting all that information out in that very methodical, structured way was really valuable. It's a little difficult as a Welshman looking at some of those stats. It's a little bit of a painful read, but, but it's so important to know where we stand before we start to address the problem. So thank you very much for that. And of course, the recommendations. I, I think the one thing I would like to say in summarizing is, you know, just how important the translational side is. You've highlighted it many times. Those of us who worked in the system in Wales for, you know, many years, you know, we've been banging on about the, the, that we didn't have high funding in Wales where, you know, um, over many, many years. Now, it's true to say we did have the European funding money, but, you know, um, this continued focus on translational research seems to me to be a really, really good thing. So, um, in conclusion, Jochavari and Richard, thank you very much indeed. You, you really sort of taken us through a tremendous lecture and then answered so many questions. Um, you know, with such authority, it's been a delight to listen to you. And the Learner Society is, is very grateful to you, first of all, and is very, very anxious to be engaged in this debate going forward. You know, as we hope to see all of your recommendations implemented, we hope that we can play our part in, in, in making that happen. Thank you all for coming. And um, see you at our next event.